everybody and welcome to Summer Tomato Live. How's it going tonight? Uh, as usual, I'd like a few of you to please say hello in the chat so I can make sure that I actually hit start because sometimes I forget to do that <laughs> and that the visuals and audio is working. Awesome. Looks like we're doing good. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for turning, tuning in. Sorry we're a little bit late uh, starting today. I had to, some technical difficulties I was working out, but Today, today's episode is going to be about cooking oils and cooking fats and whether or not they're dangerous at high temperatures and all that good stuff. Um, but before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Daria Pino and I run the website Summer Tomato, as you guys all know, because you are awesome subscribers. And uh, this, the show is a the show is called Summer Tomato Live, and we'll be talking about the questions that you guys ask and send in to me. And I go do a ton of research. I've been researching this like for days and give you the best answers I can on A, how to interpret all the information that's thrown at us at the, in the media and also what that means for you in terms of what you do in your daily life to be as healthy as possible but also very happy, which I think is just as important. So for those of you who are watching the recorded version of this, and one day you would like, if you would like to participate live, you can do that at tinyletter.com slash summer tomato. Right now, it, this live show is only available to subscribers. And, and uh, in addition to, so subscribers to my newsletter, Tomato Slice, which is a premium newsletter, it's $3.99 a month. And if you subscribe, what you get, the main thing you get is you get email access to me and I will answer any of your new que nutrition questions whenever they pop up. You can just ping me whenever. And also, occasionally, I send out little bonus tips and tidbits that is content that doesn't make it all the way on the summer tomato, and it's we always have good discussions over that. And then, of course, access to this live show, and it's really awesome. So, if you're interested, uh, sign up at tinyletter.com/summertomato, and I will. I can see that my normal background is gone, but in the future, I will add that to the show notes later and at the bottom of the screen. So. Like I said, I, like I sent the, I, all this, every subscriber here today knows that I sent an email out today saying that the show is going to be a little shorter than normal. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started because there's a lot to cover here. So hopefully this works. Awesome. So I get this question all the time. People call, uh, email me and write to me and they want to know. They're worried because there's a lot. There's been a lot of news in the media that if you heat oils to a certain temperature, or if you certain hurt, heat certain kinds of oils at all, that somehow the heat degrades them and they become very toxic to you. And people have been emailing me worried that things like olive oil and other oils that they eat regularly and enjoy are somehow dangerous for them. And that's a really good question. I've seen this in the news myself. And I wanted to get to the bottom of it because it's a very interesting question. Because generally on the show and on the Summer Tomato website, I'm a big supporter of dietary fat consumption. It, you know, the, all the rumors that we've been told for years and years that lo low fat was good and dietary fat is bad have been shown to be actually the reverse. So generally, dietary fat is not associated with heart disease. And I'm talking about total fat. And if anything, it helps, you know, it's, it's, it helps with preventing heart disease because it raises good, your good HDL cholesterol as well as helps reduce your insulin resistance and re uh, reduces the incidence of diabetes and things like that. So it also it really is a very wonderful culinary part of your life. And, you know, fat makes food taste good. That's why we enjoy it. And I think that's important as well. And... So, and it, it, improve, it helps you feel full after eating as well. So I find that if I eat a very low-fat diet, I can just eat and eat and eat and eat, and that's because I'm not getting those satisfying uh, hormonal signals you get when you do eat some fat in your food. So the, the issue of fat is quite important, but obviously we don't want to be doing some things that are going to make us less healthy. So... So there's a couple issues here. There, this is a very complicated topic because there, there's several things to consider. So the, the first question you we want to I, I wanted to sort of first question you we want to I, I wanted to sort of get at is what what are we worried about here? So the the data that we see um, thrown out there is that so there's a couple things that can be happening. So one, heating food is known to reduce 
some beneficial compounds in foods, right? So there are certain uh, elements to food, uh, either molecules or compounds or or vitamins or antioxidants that are sensitive to heat. They're very the delicate. This is my puppy toaster. Oh, you can't see him, but he's very cute. And these are these are really subject to degradation very easily. They can either degrade at room temperature. They can de be degraded by light sometimes. They can be degraded and definitely be degraded by heat. And that's that's not always good. You do want to get some of these compounds sometimes. Vitamin C is a great example of something that is very volatile is the word we use. It means it's not very stable. And so, for example, when you cook anything with vitamin C, most of that vitamin C is going to disappear, which is why probably why we evolved to eat fruits raw because there's lots of natural vitamin C in fruits and we generally don't need to cook them delicious raw. So that is true for vitamin C, but another type of food that that's really relevant for is essential fatty acids and certain kinds of fatty acids and particularly polyunsaturated fats as well. So 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 polyunsaturated fats tend to be very unstable. And so when you're considering what what oils to A, keep around in your house, and B, to cook with, polyunsaturated fats tend to be the least stable. And so, but why, okay, so, that, so that's important. We don't want to be eating, we don't want to be losing the benefits of the foods that we're getting. And then, and then there's another issue, which is, are there bad things that are produced when you heat food or cook it in some, at, at a certain temperature, something like that. And, and that is something that depends on more than just the saturation of the, food, of the, the fats or the chemical composition. So in an oil specifically, we're going to be making it, there, there are refinement, like how refined the oil is, is going to play a factor because the other stuff in the oil is, can, can be subject to degrading. So if you clean all that stuff out of there, and you know, sometimes those are the benefits that you're sweeping away. But if you get rid of all that stuff, you're left with a more stable oil. So t refined oils actually can have a higher smoking point, which is the point, the heat temperature at which they break down. And that's because they have less stuff in there that sort of like combust and catch fire and, and turn into things that aren't necessarily good for you. So those are sort of the two issues that we're dealing with. As far as losing the benefits of, of oils from heating up, that's something that I don't think that people need to worry about. And interestingly, a lot of the articles that I found that were not scientific articles, but sort of just people complaining or telling, the sort of articles that you see that say not to heat your olive oil or whatever, they tend to say the reason is because it breaks down these beneficial compounds. But you know, I don't think that's necessarily a big deal because it doesn't mean you're never eating raw olive oil. I mean, you don't get those compounds anywhere else. So I think that's sort of a, a moot point if you're eating a healthy diet, whether or not you're breaking down a couple of your good chemicals when you're heating it because there's a lot of benefits of cooking your food that outweigh that. Now, the, the other question is whether or not you're getting bad sort of byproducts from, eat, from heating your oils too much. And there, there is some, something to this, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. But uh, one thing I want to say before I go any further, though, is what I, one thing that I noticed that was really surprising to me was I feel like if you if you read the news and, and you listen to these people who are very adamant about not heating their oils past certain temperatures and only using this kind of oil versus that kind of oil, they they act as if this is sort of a life or death imperative, and there this is like absolutely concrete reality, and anybody who tells you otherwise is sort of you know, writing you a death sentence, there's hardly any data on this at all. And even less of that data is convincing in any certain way to be meaningful to humans. So I want you to keep that in mind as I'm talking about this stuff. Like I did my best to piece together all this information from what's out there, but I would search something like, you know, grapeseed oil toxic or, or grapeseed oil oxidation, which is what happens when it breaks down. And there's like eight papers, you know, and, and, not, and most of them are in something completely irrelevant. So it, it's not, it's not as clear cut right now as you might think based on some stuff you find on the internet. And to me that, that makes it a little, like all of this a little bit less interesting, right? If, if I had if I found some really strong data, I'd 
obviously be happy to tell you guys about it, but this whole thing, I feel like we still don't really know very much. We, don't, we still don't really know, have answers for all this stuff. There are some things we do know. And the main ones involve when you heat oil, any oil, past its smoking point for an extended period of time. There's a lot of problems there. There's a couple, the couple things I want to point out specifically. One is that, and this, this was found in, particularly in Chinese, in China, in Chinese homes where there was a lot of wok cooking at very, very high temperatures and no ventilation, women have a ridiculously high incidence of lung cancer there. And they're not big smokers. So this has been actually traced back to the burning oil as something that promotes lung cancer. And that's, that's true. I mean, I, there, was a, there was a very compelling body of evidence suggesting that if you're working on a very hot temperatures and you're burning oil in a pan, then you don't want to be breathing that stuff. But that brings me to my next point, which is that when oil is going bad, and when, you, when you're overcooking oil and it's, it's past its smoke point, you can tell. So it's really stinky and it tastes bad. Like it, it gets to the point where it tastes bad. It gets bitter and an, it gets an unpleasant sort of metallic taste when you have rancid oil. So generally speaking, you just want to avoid that situation. The another, another point that's important is that the length of time and the, de the degree of your heat are also very important. So but mostly length of time. Most of the studies I found that were looking at the impact of oil that has been degraded from cooking, has gone past its smoking point and has become dangerous, was almost always from studies of extensive deep frying. And when I say extensive, I mean like hours, like three to eight hours of deep frying. And I don't know anybody who does that. Do you know anybody who deep fries stuff for eight hours? <laughs> well, except, except, um, there are, so there are people who do. Nobody does that in their home, but people do that at fast food restaurants, right? They use the same vat of oil all day, as well as uh, food processors. So people who are deep frying things and then putting it into a bag and plastic and selling it to you, they will use the same oil over and over again. And that stuff is really dangerous. So, so the best advice that I found from all of this is that if you're going to be doing an extensive amount of deep frying, which you might, you never know, the one thing you want to be sure of is that you change your oil regularly and that you don't heat it up and then let it cool and then heat it up and let it cool because that is when it's sick. And, and that's not necessarily something that you're going to necessarily be able to smell because it's not necessarily a smoking point issue. It's a degradation issue So because, because deep frying. Frying oils tend to have a higher smoking point. People think it's okay, but it's not. So those are the biggest issues. And, and beyond that, you, you get to a level of degree. So let's see. I'm already past. Right. So, so then the question is, well, what is good to cook on like a, at home, right? So uh, your, your stovetop doesn't get nearly as hot as a deep fryer. And what's interesting is I've heard a lot that olive oil, and particularly extra virgin olive oil, was not a good choice for cooking because uh, I, I thought people had argued that the phenols um, were very subject to degrading, which is true, but not at the length of time that you're generally talking about for cooking with olive oil. But also what's interesting is the, the phenols actually have a tendency to counteract the negative effects of heating. So actually, actually virgin olive oil is actually really pretty good to cook with, interestingly enough. And it has a fairly, it's a decently high uh, for medium heat smoking point, like 375, it's pretty hot. And, and, it and any, the only study I found that had a real problem with olive oil being heated, it was, like I said, a, an extended period of time for deep frying. And who deep fries with olive oil? And who does it for eight, or like three to eight hours? No one. So. Uh, I, 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 from what I saw, any use, even, even I'd say even a little bit higher temperatures, like I roast some stuff, like my cauliflower recipe that you guys have seen probably, I roasted a 500. I, use, I generally use olive oil. It's never smoked or gone um, or tasted rancid to me. And 
but the, the, but the, but it's only even if it does. I mean, the, the amount it, that the damage that it could possibly do is going to be a very short period of time. It's only you know I only cook it for twenty minutes or half an hour max. So I, I really couldn't find much compelling evidence to say that anything is much better than olive oil. I, I've heard some people say that grapeseed oil is better, and that is. I couldn't find any evidence for that. It has a slightly higher smoking point, but not that much higher. But it's also much higher in polyunsaturated fats, which means it's less stable. It's actually a very unstable oil. So I, I don't think grapeseed is a better choice at all um, in terms of in terms of uh, cooking or using generally. If you are going to be cooking at higher temperatures. What you want to look for is high smoking points and actually. Let me get you guys right now. I'll, I'll link over. I think I have it. The smoking points for. Here you go. Boink. For foods. So uh, th th that's a pretty reliable. Wikipedia is pretty good. So, um, so, yeah, so the Wikipedia article on cooking oil will give you the the general smoking points of foods. The other thing you want to consider is how saturated the fat is. So the every every oil you're going to use is going to be a combination of saturated, unsat monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. The most stable of all are going to be the most saturated. So if you're, you know, if you're not using animal products for cooking, then coconut oil and palm oil are your best bets. And I had one person ask me about coconut oil. It shouldn't taste like coconut, it's it's not gonna taste like coconut water or anything like that. So if you and if it does, you're you you're getting a weird version of it. So the so coconut oil and palm oil are gonna have the highest, be the most stable in heat, and then and then what you want to have the most of is monounsaturated fats, and you want to have the least polyunsaturated fats for cooking. And so that's why olive oil is pretty good. It's almost all, all monounsaturated fat, and I'm trying to think of this other ones. Yeah, grapeseed oil is, is very largely polyunsaturated fat. And, you know, canola, canola oil, I generally uh, don't recommend because it tends to be genetically modified and highly processed. So, so processing is another thing you want to consider because some of the breakdown can happen before you even get the bottle if it's been highly processed. So you want to avoid processing processed oils that have gone through uh, sort of a heat heat process. So you want to look for the either the cold press or the expeller press, which means it's mechanically pressed oils as opposed to the heat heat treated oils. Those are going to be there. You're going to be your best bet. I'll, I wouldn't necessarily split hairs over stuff like this. I I feel like because what. I started to get it at this earlier, but I never really finished my thought, which is that like, what are you worried about? We have to, you have to sort of think about what are you worried about if your oils are turning into, I mean, I've heard people say that olive oil turns into trans fat in a frying pan. So trans fat, if you're worried about trans fat, you're worried about heart disease. And you can test that really easily. And there's probably a hundred things you're doing every day that can have a bigger impact on your risk for heart disease than like the olive oil that might be turning into like four molecules of trans fat in your pan, which I don't know, I've never even actually seen evidence of that. So, and then another thing I noticed when I was going through all this stuff was that the, a lot of the studies were like totally not cited. A lot of studies that people link to, they're just articles and they don't have any scientific references in them at, them at all. It doesn't even say what journal it's in. So to me that means it's not in a journal. So it's not science. <laughs> so, um, awesome. And does, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Yeah, so um, personally, I, I think olive oil is great, and I'm, I'm surprised to see that even extra virgin olive oil is actually probably the best. It even has a higher smoking point than regular olive oil. E or virgin olive oil is probably the best for co for cooking. Oh, another. So one other thing I want I did want to talk about was um, when you cook meats. So uh, cooking meat at high temperatures does seem to produce something called hydrocyclic amines, HCAs. And those have been linked to some cancer studies, especially when people eat them at really high quantities. But mostly the studies have been in rodents and at ridiculous 
ridiculous quantities. So I'd say the occasional grilled steak is probably not that bad. Uh, but if you're eating a lot, a lot of meat grilled at very high temperatures, uh, that's probably something you, you want to be aware of. And, and you'll avoid that by cooking things slower. So roasting is going to be better. Sous vide is going to be a better option. Things like that. Okay, dokily. So that is what I have on that stuff. I'm going to um, go start taking questions now. And drop this one. Okay, this is a good one. And Shannon, if you could load up one of those other questions now, that'd be great. Um, okay, so what is my opinion on macadamia nut oil? And what are some suggestions for using macadamia and sesame oils? So I think macadamia nut oil is fantastic. It's going to be on the more saturated end, which is good. It's going to be very stable. Um, it tastes amazing. So I feel like you, while you could cook with it, it tastes so good, and it's kind of it's pretty expensive. So I would personally use it as a, a flavored oil for a garnish, like a salad or some other dish. I bet it would be good on beans. Just saying. Um, and the same thing with sesame oil. They're they have they have a decent. They're they're so flavorful that it, it you don't really want to use them as your main cooking. I think because it's going to be overpowering for the food. So I mean I like olive oil because it's got that sort of fruity flavor that adds to food. If you want something with a more neutral flavor, I think coconut oil is your best bet. It's it's really I mean if you're getting a, a version that it sh that's not you know it shouldn't be flavored. It should just be straight up coconut oil and it should be good. Yeah, and peanut oil is another decent one for for cooking in high heat. Um, yeah, but I mean, if you're asking if those are healthy oils, yes, they're healthy, so long as they're not, you know, I, I would definitely go for the ones that are not heated and processed that way, the better cold, cold extracted. I haven't tried palm oil yet either, Amanda. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. So James wants to know, does one need be, to be concerned about oils that are packaged as aerosol? So that's, I mean, it's, I would be. I would definitely be worried about that. Um, I don't know how they do that, though, which is, you know, is, is it really, like, because I know there's this ones where you can add your own olive oil and sort of pump it up and spray, but if it's just a straight-up aerosol can, I would... I would be nervous about that because they are very reactive oils, and I don't, depending on what kind of gas they put in there, it might be it might be bad. If it's just a, if it's just a spray bottle, though, I wouldn't worry about it. Does that make sense? I I'm, I I don't I've, I've never actually seen that before, so I've never thought of that. <laughs> but um, I'm happy to look at it though, I mean, especially if you have a specific brand that you have seen or you're curious about. If you want to email me the link, I, I'll I'll happily take a look at that for you and let you know. Awesome. So this is my next question, and this was something that I was planning on covering, and I asked Shannon, my awesome helper, to load that in there for you guys. So I wanted to talk about, because I had someone ask me this during the last office hours, I believe it was, which is what is up with roasted nuts? And because I there, I've definitely seen. Here we go. I've definitely seen people say that roasted nuts. If you roast the nuts, the oil on the outside becomes rancid, and is bad for you. And I looked everywhere for this rancid point and couldn't find. I mean, the word rancid isn't used very much in like science papers and so that brought up nothing I found a couple interesting points though and I love I love when this happens I think it's awesome so I found a couple studies that say the effect of roasting on the antioxidant availability of nuts so nuts are good sources of healthy fats they're good sources of fiber and they're good sources of antioxidants and specifically 
phenol ex, uh, phenols and different, um, just like coffee and wine are, are rich in these phenols that are that are healthy for you. And turns out that in certain kinds of nuts that roast actually makes them more antioxidant rich and increases the availability of the antioxidants, which I think is funny. <laughs> um, yeah, it says in this one in this one study, which I'll link to when I post the show notes, it says antioxidant activities of cashew nut kernels and, and test of phenolics extract increase the roasting increase as the roasting temperature increase. So in this case, more roasting resulted in higher antioxidants. But it is more complicated than that. And there are definitely some volatile compounds that increase the amount of when they're roasted, increase the amount of acrylamide in the nuts, and that's bad. And um, what, they, what they found was that generally there's, in a, in a, there's, there's a couple different studies. One said that at low temperatures, when, when nuts are roasted at fairly low temperatures, that the, the amount of acrylamide was fairly low. But as the temperatures went higher and the time of the roasting went longer, the acrylamide levels increased significantly so that's a factor and it didn't really you know it, it's really hard to you know, to say how to balance these things generally speaking the more antioxidants you have in there that acrylamide and is going to have a less impact um personally i'd go by taste <laughs> if you get if you start out with fresh nuts that aren't already ranted most, a lot of nuts you get in the stores like already are rancid. You can tell by tasting them. They should be fresh, crisp, and delicious. Um, and if they still taste good, I'd say go for it. <laughs> Generally, my my rule: your body knows when stuff isn't good for you. Your taste buds know. Um, also, the amount of acrylamide that's produced from roasting is going to depend a lot on the kind of nuts. So, I found something that said that almonds have a lot of uh, the amino acid asparagine, which is the sort of the precursor to acrylamide. But hazelnuts have way less. So, you know, maybe if you're going to have a roasted nut, go with a, not almonds. Maybe almonds raw and go with a roasted um, cashew or a roasted hazelnut instead. So that's, I mean, if you're, if you're really worried about this stuff. But, yeah, generally speaking, you... Rancid oils taste terrible. Like they taste terrible. So you should be able to tell if you don't want to be eating things that don't taste good. General advice. All right. Do you have any questions about that? I... Okay, so here's a good question. When shopping, how can you tell if an oil is stable or not other than the expiration date? So that's a good question. So think so factors to consider are so you, you should generally, generally, so if you're going to go shopping and you know you're going to want a certain kind of oil, like maybe a recipe calls for it or you buy it all the time and you just never bothered to look at the nutrition info before, go online and see a couple things. One, it's smoking point, and, you know, that'll tell you how you can use it to cook. Two, how much unsaturated versus saturated versus or monounsaturated versus polyunsaturated versus saturated fat is in it and keep in mind that if you're going to be cooking more saturated fat and more monounsaturated fat is preferable polyunsaturated fats are better left uncooked as much as possible i mean you don't need to be crazy about this but generally speaking also polyunsaturated fats are going to have a much shorter shelf life and what i mean by that is um Walnut oil, for example, is so delicious. But walnut oil is very high in, in polyunsaturated fats and omega threes and things like this, and it'll only last a couple weeks. And you should keep it in the fridge, and it, and you should keep it in a dark bottle because light is a factor as well. And in the fridge because it's nice and cold, cold in there, and it'll last longer in the fridge. So for things like that, for things like walnut oil, I buy the smallest thing I can find because I can always buy more. I want to buy more but I don't want it going bad on my shelf. So, yeah, the expiration date is something you can look at. You also want to look for, like for olive oils, for example, you want to look for, you're better off if it's in a dark bottle. Unless you're using it, like actually I go through like a giant thing like this every few weeks. I mean, cooking for, I cook at home almost every meal. And I cook for my boyfriend sometimes, so it's a lot. 
And um, so I don't worry that much about that. But if, if it's an oil, you're not going to be using a lot. A dark bottle is a good call. You also want to look at how it was processed. It should be on the label somewhere. You want to look for uh, uh, cold pressed, expeller pressed, things like that. And organic is going to be better too because that means they're not going to use any bleachers or deodorizers or anything like that in it. But then again, if you're going to be deep frying, which you know is fine every once in a while, a refined oil might be a better choice uh, because it'll have the higher smoking point, even though there may be some disadvantages of using a more refined oil, but you know, you're going to be better off with the higher smoking point for deep frying. So I would, those are sort of the factors I would consider in going into it. And also generally don't get your panties in a bunch about stuff like this, because if you're worried about heart disease, like I said before, there's a zillion other ways to uh, impact that as, you know, and if you're curious about those, go ahead and read Summer Tomato. <laughs> so it's a great question. Yeah, a lot of oils need to be refrigerated after opening. Okay, so I'm going to move on to my last uh, topic today, and that is what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of eating canned fish? Oh, I meant to say how often should I eat them? Um, so this was a question that was asked by a reader, and I think it's a really good question because I've been curious about this myself because obviously there's a lot of advantages of eating fish, you, the, the, I, I'm always astounded at how beneficial it seems. Like the, the evidence is just amazing for reduction in heart disease, reduction in dementia, you know, just general better aging. It's important for so many things, you know, concentration, all sorts of cognitive issues. But there's all these, there's all these problems, right? There's the mercury component of fish, which is Generally, you can avoid by eating smaller fish like sardines and stuff. And, and then fish is also expensive. So as a student, I was eating a lot of canned sardines, canned salmon, things like that. And, you know, but, but I also read that preserved and processed foods can be dangerous. So I looked into this. And so one issue is that of all the – so generally food in cans, one of the issues we've learned about in the last – 10 years, I think, is that bisphenol A, BPA, is in it, in the can lining, and can leach into the food, and can be, it's an endocrine disruptor. You know, it's probably not the worst thing in the world if you're not eating it very often, and you're an adult, but if you're a ki if I had kids, I, I would feel weird of feeding them things that I knew had BPA in them, because they're developing in their nervous system still, and their hormones are very important when you're developing. So, endocrine means hormone, by the way. So yeah, you, you don't want your hormones disrupted, especially in children. But and fish is one of the most, one of the biggest sources of BPA. Canned fish, one of the biggest sources of BPA. In one study I found that was took place in Canada. So I'd be worried a little bit about that. And if possible, I'd look for. Usually, it's going to be your brands that are going to care enough to take the BPA out of their cans, and they'll probably cost more. So that's something I'd definitely consider if you're eating a lot. I would limit your BPA as much as possible. And the other, I couldn't find anything that said that the preserved fish were bad. I found one thing that said it had a decreased risk of prostate cancer, which is interesting, but I know that the person who emailed me was female, so she probably doesn't care about prostate cancer. Um, but generally, canned fish is a good source of the omega-3s, and, and as long as you're getting the smaller fish, and and getting less mercury, it's going to be generally a good source. The only other issue that I found was that some canned fish had like weird levels of heavy metals in them, like lead and arsenic, and that's bad. But generally, they weren't at levels that were dangerous, and it wasn't that common. So I, I'm at the point, like, I, after reading through it, I wasn't worried about it for myself. I would continue eating, I would continue eating the canned fish, and, like, you know, I probably eat it every single day, but a couple times a week is probably fine, and, and that's, that was one thing that she asked was, how often can I eat them? Um, and, unfortunately, the science really doesn't have an answer for that. I would say, I would... I would worry most about the BPA and the, and the mercury, and that I would 
not be too worried if I wasn't planning or if it wasn't possible that I could get pregnant. But if, but if you're worried, if you're considering, you know, mercury has a fairly long life. So I would definitely stop eating that stuff like six months to probably a year before trying to have children. So that's my, that's my advice on that. And I've written a lot about mercury before. You probably know about mercury and probably weren't worried about that. But the BPA is something I'd also worry about with children and, and hormones. And that's about it. So I will post all the links that I'm referencing here in the show notes. And I'm sorry I've been behind in um, posting the shows and putting them on iTunes. And that's because I've had some, I had some issues with the program that I used to, to capture the screen. But I got it all fixed. So I just need to like bang through it and, and get them all out. And hopefully I'll do that soon. And that won't be a problem anymore. So that is it for my notes. Let me see if I have any more questions here. This is an interesting question. Uh, would I prefer frozen fish over canned fish? Yes, I think. I mean, given the option. I mean, it'll affect texture a teensy bit, but not terribly. And the only the bigger issue, so if you're going to go that route, the fresh fish route, fresh slash frozen, I would just go for wild over farmed. I, I'm The farmed fish would scare me. That, that, you know, all farm salmon is dyed pink because it doesn't have the natural diet that makes the nutrients form in the fish that turn it pink. So, I mean, I just don't want to be eating dye, second of all, and third. And also, I don't want to be eating fish that doesn't have the same nutrient value. That's the point. So, yeah, go. And I've heard bad things. And they also have um, more likely PCBs and other carcinogenic chemicals at their farm. So I go wild. Try to go sustainable since our oceans are going to be out of fish in, like, our lifetimes. And, you know, sort of do your best. Go with, I, I eat small fish a lot. I really try to choose the sardines and the, the super sustainable stuff if I can. Um, and, yeah, I, I would – I mean, the, there's a big difference between canned fish and fresh fish culinarily, if nothing else. And also just sort of the, the price, how to prepare it. So I, I generally think they're both fine, though. Awesome. Looks like you guys are having a good conversation. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week. If you have any more questions, of course, you're always welcome to email me after the show, and I will write you back. And that's it. So thanks again for watching. Again, for any new watchers, uh, you can subscribe at tinyletter.com slash summer tomato, or you can go onto the summer tomato website and click on the live tab and learn more about what we're doing here. So thanks so much, guys, and I will see you next time.